Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Alan Bryce. I'm medical oncologist here at Mayo Clinic in Arizona, a genitourinary oncologist, primarily focused in prostate cancer, also chair of the Division of Hematology and Medical Oncology here. Um, Ms. Jones has just logged on. She's our course director, moderator extraordinaire, um, and many other roles. Um, Stacy, do you want to say a few words as we get started? Yes, thank you, Dr. Bryce. Um, welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Stacy Jones. I uh, serve as our cancer practice administrator here at Mayo Clinic um, and looking forward to serving as your uh, facilitator today. So any questions that you have, uh, please feel free to list those either in the Q&A uh, format or in the chat, and I'll make sure to send those over to Dr. Bryce for his response. Thank you. All right, so, okay, we are feeding now. Okay, very good. So to the participants, some of you may know that we have uh, done a in-person living with cancer symposium now for several years, uh, but of course, 2021 has forced us to adjust. And so we've gone to this online format. Um, and I'm not sure if, if any of you have attended in the past, um, but really we're trying to really be very similar, just some adjustments, uh, you know, nodding to, to the need to, you know, keep people safe in these uncertain times. Um, and we will uh, be sending you a, a link for some feedback afterwards. Uh, we certainly would like to know if you feel the format works, uh, what could be done better. Uh, this is our first go at trying to run this uh, symposium online. Um, so we miss out on the nice lunch that the Marriott provided there uh, for the last several years. But nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, we do want to continue to connect and we don't want to be cut off just because we're not allowed to gather in person. So uh, for the prostate session, uh, I am going to uh, go through some introductory remarks, if you will, uh, it, at least in our live sessions. What we found over the last several years is that um, is that the attendees really came in with a lot of questions of their own. And we want to make sure that there's ample time to answer those. And, and over the years, our presentations got shorter and shorter because we knew the attendees came with so many questions. Uh, now, I, I know we've got a smaller group than, than we typically have in person. So um, I guess what I'm going to do, do is go ahead and start with some introductory slides. This is very broad, if you will. Uh, but, but perhaps, um, you know, walk through some of the issues we think about in prostate cancer, uh, set the table maybe for some discussion points. And then, you know, I really want to open it up uh, for Q&A. Uh, you know, th this is really your opportunity uh, to, to ask any, you know, prostate cancer related question uh, that, that's on your mind. And, and um, you know, what we find, I mean, I've done this, like I say, for several years. The questions are, almost the same year after year, right? Things change a little bit because technology is changing, new things are coming out. But rest assured, whatever question you have, uh, there's probably other people with the same question, right? You're all on the same journey. And, uh, you know, it's helpful uh, to, to other people as well if you, you know, put your question forward because there's probably other people thinking it and, and not asking it. So uh, please do send your questions in and, and I'm, I'm happy to take the time to answer uh, any and all. Um, all right, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, take you through a slide deck. Like I say, this is fairly brief, uh, about 10, 15 minutes, just an introductory slide deck um, to touch on some topics and then, um, uh, and then we'll go to the Q&A from there. All right. And then Dr. Moore was going to be joining us today, but um, she got called away. So it'll just be, uh, it'll just be myself and, and Ms. Jones then. All right. So when we talk about prostate cancer, I, I want to walk through this uh, really from early stage to late. Like I say, this is a brief slide deck, only 15 minutes, and it's meant to be very, um, you know, very 30,000 foot, right? To, to top, touch on some topics. 
But starting at the beginning with, with prostate cancer, you know, one of the fundamental things is trying to understand which men have aggressive disease that needs to be treated uh, before we even talk about, start talking about what kind of treatment. And so in prostate cancer, it is now absolutely a recommendation that men with early disease, that is small tumors limited to the prostate, low Gleason scores, no metastases, uh, that these men can be treated with active surveillance. And what active surveillance means is that we do not have to treat the cancer. What we just have to do is monitor it. Uh, and the reason we do that is the top of the slide you see over here. Here is over a 10 year timeline, the survival of men who get active surveillance for those low risk prostate cancers. This is the blue line is radiation. The green dotted line is active surveillance. The red line is surgery. And what you can see is there's no difference, right? No matter which path you take 10 years out, almost 100% of men are still alive, okay? Now, of course, if you don't do anything, the cancer eventually progresses. And so with radiation and surgery, most men are cured and nothing happens. With active surveillance, of course, there's a slow rate of progression year over year. But even 10 years later, you know, over 80% of men are still progression free. Their cancer hasn't changed at all. And so that's why when we talk about active surveillance, you know, the focus is very much on active, right? We don't ignore the cancer, we're watching it. There's repeat scans, there's repeat biopsies, there's repeat PSA levels. And if the PSA goes up or the biopsy looks worse or the scan looks worse, then that's the you know, 15, 20% of men who develop progression over a 10 year timeline. But here again, progression is slow. It takes years. And so for men in whom, you know, psychologically they're okay with waiting and not doing anything where, you know, life expectancy perhaps is such that, you know, 10 years is long enough or in men, who would rather at least delay the side effects of treatment, that would be surgery or radiation, then active surveillance is a great option. And there's great data supporting this. So this is always part of our conversation. But what about if you need to be treated, right? In the modern era, surgery and radiation are the, the dominant, uh, most evidence-based options for first-line therapy for localized prostate cancer. In the United States, in the modern era, surgery is usually done robotically. You know, it's an average of one night in the hospital, and about 50% of these can be done same day, right? Because these decisions are so small, patients can go home the same day, but they do have a catheter in for seven days. And so there's a follow-up process, right? There's a whole process involved, uh, but robotic surgery really has, has made outcomes much better, um, hospital stays much shorter. You know, but having said that, open surgery, the traditional open surgery is still a good surgery, right? If there's any reason, there's a variety of reasons why robot's not the best option for a patient, then open is still an option. As we say, reco recovery is a little faster with robotic. Temporary incontinence, though, is common, right? Most men are going to notice that they're Urinary control in the beginning is not very good. And that's because, you know, the pelvic muscles and the urinary sphincter are a little bit stunned by having undergone surgery. So it takes them a little time to get back to normal, okay? Um, but long-term, most men have very good urinary control. And good urinary control typically means, you know, maybe there's a little bit of incontinence with pressure, heavy lifting or coughing or whatnot, but generally, you know, just a little pad in the underwear is all that's required. Erectile dysfunction certainly happens, even with nerve sparing surgery. It's common and it is, it is a question of degree. So we get into those conversations about, okay, what about things like, you know, Viagra or the other pills? What about the other things that can be done for erectile dysfunction? Surgery is mostly curative. You know, over 80% of patients are gonna be cured with first line therapy. But sometimes men have higher risk disease, you know, they have surgery and what was thought to be a low Gleason or maybe a Gleason 7 turns out to be an 8, 9, 10. Maybe there's disease in the lymph nodes, maybe there's positive margins. And those patients, we talk about additional therapy with hormones or radiation. 
And ultimately, and we can get to this in the Q&A if people are interested, there are emerging technologies, you know, focal therapies, cryoablation, HIFU, whatnot. At this time in 2020, they still don't have the level of evidence and experience as traditional surgery and radiation do. But rest assured, there's a lot of work going into trying to develop other techniques other than just the traditional surgery. With radiation therapy, there's a number of options and we'll touch on them a little bit. Traditional radiation therapy is external beam. This is where the patient's lying on a table and you know, I'll show you a little picture of how that works. And the, the beam of radiation comes from outside. There's brachytherapy where the radioactive seeds are actually implanted into the prostate itself. And nowadays, uh, there's a lot of activity with these radioisotopes. So these are injectable isotopes that through one mechanism or another, home into the site of interest and deliver radiation uh, after being given IV. Here, for example, is a, a, a LINAC. So this is the patient lying on the table. The beam actually comes out of here. And this beam can rotate all the way around the patient the patient can be moved back and forth on the table and it allows the radiation oncologist to have a, a three-dimensional targeting of the tumor. Brachytherapy, this is how the seeds are implanted. And Zofago, this is an injectable radiation. In terms of a general process, so there's multiple steps a patient will go through from the initial consultation to the CT simulation. So that's where a CT scan is taken so that the uh, position of the organs can be looked at and the radiation oncologist can start planning how they wanna deliver the radiation. There's a quality assurance step. And this is what the radiation oncologist ends up with. He ends up with a picture of the, uh, of the pelvis. He starts to outline where the various organs are. Right, so here's the hip socket. There's the rectum in green, the bladder in yellow, the prostate in the middle there. And they start to plan out how the radiation will be delivered in order to minimize the radiation to the healthy organs and to maximize the radiation delivered to the prostate itself. Proton therapy. Mayo is a proton center. We always get questions about this, so we, we spend a little time talking about it. The magic of proton therapy is based on what you see here, this is called the Bragg peak. So with traditional radiation, you know, there's this, this radioactive isotope is shot through the body and you know, you have, this, you have this line of radioactivity and then with distance, it slowly starts to fall off like a hill. What you have with proton is this cliff. A proton can be controlled so such that there is a low level of radiation being released until a specific spot and then the bulk of radiation is released and then it falls off a cliff, okay? And so what ends up happening is the radiation oncologist can decide based upon the amount of energy he gives that photon where he wants that radiation to be released. So if he wants it released after 50 millimeters, he gives it 70 uh, millivo uh, well, micro millivolts of, electric of uh, energy. If he wants it to be released after you know, 300 plus millimeters, he gives it more. And so this is the control that you get out of proton. And that's why it has attraction. Because what that means is that there's no radiation being given out here once the proton leaves the organ. And there's little being given over here as it enters the patient's body. Rather, the bulk of the dose is given exactly where the radiation doctor wants it to be. So this is a nice picture you might have seen at previous talks. This is a patient who was getting radiation for cancer in the spinal cord. So what you see here is a picture of the spine. Right in the middle is the spinal cord, okay? And then these are the vertebral bodies. This is your spine. And with traditional radiation, the radiation would come in the back. The maximum dose would be here on the spine and then it would pass out the front of the patient. And what you would see on a patient is, is a strip of burnt skin where it goes in and a strip of burnt skin on the front where the radiation is coming out. But with the proton, the radiation oncologist is able to plan it such that the maximum dose is here in yellow, minimum dose in the green, and the blue line is where the radiation stops. And the proof of that is what you see right here. 
So the white is the scarring that happens in bone when it's hit by radiation. And what you can see here is that the back of the vertebral bodies are scarred because they got a radiation dose, like you see in this plan. But the front of the vertebral bodies are normal. What that is is proof of the stopping power of protons. Okay, so that there really is no meaningful radiation passing through the body. It stops right there. And there you go. Okay, so what about proton versus traditional radiation? There's a trial going on to try to really answer the question of how much better is it, all right? Which one is better? Um, but again, the question of, you know, do you need radiation at all or should you do active surveillance? And the question of brachytherapy, this is still something debated in the radiation world. What about for more advanced disease? So I'm a medical oncologist. I deal with the, the patients whose disease comes back or, or otherwise isn't cured or not amenable to local therapy. And so I deal in the world of medicines, right? Whether it be hormones or chemo or immunotherapy or the like. So in prostate cancer, you know, it wasn't until 1941 that the idea of taking away testosterone was proven to work and Huggins and Hodges ultimately won the Nobel Prize for that. Then in 1973, we started to have studies of hormone therapy. And what you can see here is a kind of a timeline over the next, you know, 30, 40 years, you know, from 1973 to 2008, you know, 35 year period, these are the drugs that were approved. So you started to see chemotherapy. We started to see pills that blocked testosterone from interacting with the cancer cell. You saw the first kind of old fashioned radioisotopes. Then here is what happened 2011 to 2020. Okay, just, you, you saw 10 drugs that were approved between 1941 to 2010, right? Almost 70 years. You saw 10 drugs and two imaging tests approved 2011 to 2020. So the pace of change right now is fantastic. It is accelerated and we're doing much better than we did in the previous 70 years. And you know, none of this is by accident. All of this is due to the accumulation of research that span decades. And these drugs that you see here on this list, you know, they're not, uh, they're not accidental drugs where chemicals were just thrown into a test tube to see what works. These are really designer drugs that were designed specifically to target vulnerabilities in prostate cancer cells. So now, 2020, where are we? Over 1,600 active trials in the US. You know, the pace of change is not slowing down, it's accelerating even further. Immunotherapy is a huge uh, attraction in prostate cancer. And the fact of the matter is right now, we only have one relatively mild immunotherapy in Cipulusol T, and we haven't seen the kind of breakthroughs that you've seen in other cancers like breast cancer, lung cancer, melanoma, et cetera. So there's other trials going on. We're still trying to crack the code in prostate cancer. How do you make immunotherapy work? There's a way, there is a way. We're gonna figure this out, but we're still working on it. And so you have trials of CAR T therapy. You've heard about these in lymphoma and leukemia. Now these are where we take a patient's cells and instead of just cooking the cells like we do with Cipulusol T, where they get cooked against the prostate antigen, in this CAR T therapy, the T cells are specifically engineered with a viral vector usually to make them specific against prostate cells. And then they're reinfused to the patient. There's something called bispecific T cell engagers, bite therapy. We're gonna see these get approved in myeloma soon. We're working on this in prostate cancer. This is an antibody with two arms and one arm interacts with the prostate cell. The other arm attaches itself to a T cell. So it forcibly brings the T cell next to the prostate cell and makes it act against the prostate cell. You've heard a lot about PSMA targeting, right? So you hear about uh, lutetium-177, the new radiopharmaceutical that we hope we will see in 2021. You see about PSMA scans. PSMA is a great target in prostate cancer because most PSMA in the body is only on prostate cells. There's a little bit in salivary glands, there's a little bit in your tear glands, but mostly it's just on prostate cells and it sits on the surface of the prostate cell. So this protein can be used as a targeting mechanism to deliver whatever you want, whether it's gonna be radiation or chemotherapy or some kind of treatment, uh, an immune cell. 
Uh, it can be used to target prostate cancer cells. We're probably going to get a question about bipolar androgen therapy. You hear a lot about this. This is actually trying to take men who are on androgen deprivation, so their testosterone is suppressed, and we give them pulses, very brief pulses of high-dose testosterone to try to confuse the cancer cell. The Johns Hopkins team is leading this study right now, and they've got some early promising results. PARP inhibitors, right? Two drugs approved in May and June over the course of a weekend. It was fantastic. A new era is upon us in prostate cancer where genetically targeted therapy is now here. And there's other targets we're looking at, really a lot of research going on. A key point I want everyone to walk away with, in prostate cancer, genetic testing is now the expectation. Every man with advanced prostate cancer, so that's high risk, very high risk or metastatic prostate cancer, needs to have testing for cancer genes in his family. In a Mayo Clinic study of almost 3,000 patients, we found that in prostate cancer, almost 15% of men are carrying a cancer risk gene. And this matters not only to the patient, because now PARP inhibitors can be used if you carry some of these genes, but it also matters to the patient's family. You know, cancer genes, for the most part, don't just cause one cancer. A given gene can cause a variety of cancers. So the most common gene that causes prostate cancer is called BRCA2. And BRCA2 is the gene that's also associated with breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and pancreas cancer. So it's really both the men and the women in the family that need to know about this. And the issue is that if we know someone's at risk for developing cancer, then we can be more aggressive in screening and hopefully detecting it early at a young age because cancer is easiest to cure when we catch it early. And that's always the goal. Cure is the goal for every patient. And then testing of tumor mutations, right? So there's two sets of genes involved in cancer. There's the, can there's the genes in your healthy cells. That's what you got from your parents and what you pass on to your children. This is also the genes in the tumor, right? So a cancer by definition is a healthy cell that mutates to become a cancer cell. So it can have a different genetic signature and that's something we can exploit in trying to attack it. All right, so what's ahead? Lot going on. And I, you know, we can talk about this if you have questions, metabolics, microbiome. We need to talk about exercise, this remains key. And pharmacogenomics, understanding how an individual patient metabolizes a drug and, and might respond differently. Okay, last set, set of slides and then we'll get to Q&A. Lifestyle, without question, the most important thing that the cancer patient can control is diet and exercise. This remains important. This is true in every cancer, uh, really for every patient. The most important thing you can do is continue to maintain a healthy diet and continue to exercise well. You know, one of the things I always emphasize for cancer patients is remember, just because you have cancer, it doesn't mean that the cancer takes over the whole body right? And you are still, right? A, a, you know, a complete organism, heart, lungs, brain, right? Soul, right? All of these things still matter. And we can't suddenly start ignoring them and thinking that the cancer patient needs to, you know, uh, go on some cancer specific diet as if nothing else matters. It's not true. And what we found is that the heart healthy diet, that's the right diet for everyone else is still the right diet for the cancer patient. And it absolutely impacts survival and it absolutely impacts how well the patient does with treatment. There's also the fact that treatment is gonna cause side effects. So in prostate cancer, when we take away a man's testosterone, now this has a lot of metabolic effects. So it slows down a man's metabolism. Testosterone ultimately is a stimulant, right? It speeds up the metabolism. And when you take it away, metabolism slows down. And that means he's gonna start gaining weight if he doesn't do something about it. There's also the fact that testosterone stimulates bones and muscles. So we take it away and what happens is there's a loss of muscle mass, there's a loss of vigor, but also there's a loss of bone density. So in normal aging, at, at say an age of 65, a man's supposed to lose about 0.3 to 0.5% of bone density per year. 
when we take away his testosterone, that goes up tenfold to three to 5% in the first year. This is andropause. This is the male equivalent of menopause and the symptoms are much the same. So you talk, start talking about weight gain, metabolic syndrome, well, what happens with weight gain? Well, then, you know, the risk of hypertension goes up, the risk of high cholesterol goes up, the risk of diabetes goes up. So all the complications um, of impact on heart disease and impact of, of diabetes can come into play if there's excessive weight gain. And then bone health, like we say, loss of bone density is a key component of what happens to prostate cancer patients. And this can lead to increased risk of fractures, you know, loss of height. You know, we all know that, that uh, you know, people get shorter as they age, right? So that process gets accelerated by hormone therapy. So managing bone health is an important part of what we do in the clinic. So we talk about bone mineral testing, and we recommend that all men on hormone therapy go on calcium and vitamin D, 800 units of vitamin D a day and 1,500 milligrams of calcium. And here are some tips for bone health. It really is weight-bearing exercise that's the most important. And weight-bearing exercise can mean you know, running, it can mean walking, it can mean uh, doing some weights, but it means Swimming and cycling don't really count, right? Because they don't put pressure on the bones. They're, those exercises are great for cardiovascular health, but not for bone health. And then healthy eating. You know, what do we mean by healthy eating? Well, actually, most of us know, I mean, intuitively, right? Um, in the Western world, this mostly means we need to eat more fruits and vegetables, less red meat, okay? Uh, you know, more lean meats like chicken, fish, etc. The heart healthy diet really is the diet I recommend for prostate patients. You know, increased protein intake and exercise are important, but again, we want you to get lean proteins and then calcium and vitamin D as well. Lots of fruits and vegetables, right? If, you're, if your dinner plate looks like the farmer's market, you're doing well. If your dinner plate looks like McDonald's, you know, that's not good. That's not what we want. You know, red meat, we say, you know, two servings per week of a, a piece of meat the size of your palm is probably about right. Um, most, of, most Americans are, are really getting in much more than that. Lean fats like uh, fruit-based fats rather than animal fats are definitely preferred. And then again, you know, staying active, maintaining a healthy diet, healthy weight. I mean, that's what we try to emphasize. All right, so that's the end of my slides. It's just the introduction. I really wanna get into the Q&A. Um, as I say, uh, you know, whatever questions you have, other people probably have them too. So please do, uh, you know, go ahead and uh, share your questions. So Dr. Bryce, we actually have a question from Mr. Chen there. I don't know if you can see that. This question's related to the level of PSA showing the patient to have another advancing lab test. So, I'm gonna interpret that to mean what level does the PSA need to get to? Okay, so um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking this is in the context of active surveillance. So, so let me just kind of walk through it from the beginning in case we're also talking about screening. So, you know, nowadays, as far as screening, what we recommend is that if a man, and it depends where you look, some people say a PSA of three, some people say a PSA of four, on screening is a reason to have a biopsy. Now in active surveillance, what has happened is a man's already been diagnosed with prostate cancer, right? So for some reason or another, they decided to do a biopsy. They found that there's cancer cells. If we're talking active surveillance, it's gonna be low Gleason. So let's say, for example, you have a Gleason 6 on you know one biopsy or two cores or something. The man elects for active surveillance, and then what we recommend is that a PSA get checked every six months and a biopsy get repeated after 12 to 18 months. And if the PSA goes up by more than 50%, that's another reason to get a repeat biopsy, okay? And it really uh, shouldn't spike that quickly, you know, assuming you started with a PSA of like a three or a four. I mean, there is day-to-day -day fluctuation. So if you you know, check your PSA five days in a row, it might be three, 3.1, 2.9, 3.0, bounces around a little. That's why we say 50% or more, that's where we want to look at a biopsy. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. And, and if, if, you, if you were thinking something different, Mr. Chen, please just go ahead and send a, a follow-up question. 
Thank you, Dr. Bryce. Uh, we've got another question here from Kathy. Uh, her question is related to a Gleason score of 10 and when that directs more towards the lungs when a PSA was uh, 6.5 in a 63 year old man. Okay, so um, a few different pieces to this question. So when a 63 year old man has a PSA of 6.5, it's not a guarantee that he has prostate cancer, but 6.5 is high enough that we recommend uh, doing a workup, right? In all likelihood, starting with a biopsy. Now, most men with a PSA of 6.5 will still have localized disease, not metastatic disease. So 6.5 is not, you know, any kind of automatic uh, indicator of metastases. And then this is an important point about PSA is, you know, PSA is useful but it's not an absolute indicator. You know, there's almost nothing we can say based on PSA alone. There's even patient, patients with PSAs of 100 who never develop metastatic disease. Okay, and that's unusual, but it can happen. Now, the biopsy was done in this case. You saw a Gleason of 10. Gleason 10 is high. So the scale for Gleason uh, functionally really goes from six to 10. You know, one through five are kind of the non-cancerous changes that a, a pathologist might see. So six is considered low, seven is mid, and eight, nine, 10 are high. And the reason Gleason is useful is Gleason does predict for the likelihood of cure versus, you know, the disease coming back later. It, it, it predicts outcomes. And so in Gleason 10, you're absolutely more likely to see metastases than in say Gleason 6, okay? But it's still not absolute. You know, it, it is still the case, you know, if, if you told me we had, you know, 20 men come into the clinic with PSA 6.5, Gleason 10, most of them are still gonna have localized disease and be able to undergo surgery or radiation. That's not somebody we would do active surveillance. It's less common that there would be metastases. Now, when we talk about metastatic disease, the most common site of metastases are, are uh, bones and lymph nodes. Okay, you know, 85 to 90 percent of prostate cancer patients who develop metastases will have it at these sites, one or the other or both. Lung metastases happen in about 25 percent of prostate cancer patients, liver in about 20 percent, adrenal glands in 10 to 15 percent and other organs, you know, less than 10 percent. Brain metastases, you know, probably 1 percent. So lung is, is really the third most common site of metastatic disease. And in fact, lung metastases carry the same prognosis as bone metastases. But once you start getting liver and adrenal, that's where you're talking about more aggressive disease. So you know, the question of, of um, how often do we see it? Um, overall, about 25% of men will get metastases who have metastatic disease will have metastases to the lungs. But really the majority of men with, Gle with PSA 6.5, Gleason 10, I would not, not expect to see lung metastases right away. If it happens, I'd expect to see it happen later. And then, um, okay, if you were diagnosed as liver cancer without biopsies in the US, but you had another diagnosis negative and um, show APS on liver in Taiwan. So um, I'm not sure what they're saying with APS here, um, but you know, so, so, but I'll answer this question um, in general, the interpretation of pathology is the most important first step in the cancer diagnostic process, okay? So we do not diagnose cancer on scans. We do not diagnose cancer by PSA. We diagnose cancer by tissue, okay? Scans can be suspicious. We can be 99% sure sometimes. PSA can be suspicious. You know, we can be highly confident that it's cancer, but we're never sure that we're dealing with cancer until we have a biopsy. And you know the purpose of biopsy is not just to secure the diagnosis, 
but it's also to try to look for the different types of cancer. You know, sometimes we're surprised, right? Someone says, oh, I think you've got lung cancer and the biopsy shows, no, it's actually prostate or it's bladder or it's something else. You have to get a biopsy to know what you're dealing with. Now, you know, this question of who do you trust with the biopsy interpretation, okay? And pathologists are like, you know, uh, in people in any industry or, or people in medicine, right? There's levels, oh, arterial portal shunt, gotcha, yeah. Um, there are levels of specialization, okay, in, in, um, in pathology. So at a place like a Mayo Clinic or, or the big cancer centers, you're gonna have dedicated genitourinary pathologists who really, all they do all day is look at genitourinary tissue. Uh, and they're going to be better at you know, knowing what's prostate cancer, for example. In GI pathologists, right, that are special specialized in looking at GI pathology, liver, colon, whatnot. Um, so when there's disagreement, you know, what I would recommend is you take the tissue to, you know, a, a top quality center and kind of get the, um, the tiebreaker vote, if you will. Right? You want a, a dedicated, specialized pathologist uh, to really answer it. And, and you know, it probably has, le it's, it's not about the country, right? I mean, there are great physicians, you know, overseas, there's great physicians in the U.S. What you want is a specialist who does just the thing that you need uh, the question answer for, answered for, right? So you want someone who specializes in cancer in the liver if you, you know, need a tiebreaker vote. Got another one. You see this? Yes. Here. All right. So, Mr. Belfry. Yeah. Yes. So, what follow-up imaging should one have after the first year of treatment with Gleason 9 and total metastases of the spine doing hormone therapy? Okay. So, in metastatic prostate cancer, you know, this is patients whose disease is spread. In this example, we're talking about metastases that have gone to the spine. And in metastatic cancer, the uh, the value of PSA, it, you know, it's helpful directionally. If PSA is going up, you worry a little more. If it's going down, you're happy. But it's not a perfect test. Okay, so th this is part of the, the standard spiel I give to my patients. My patients understand that PSA is not the fundamental basis by which we make decisions. Now, you'll get some variety in, in answering this question from different doctors, okay? What I tell people is a hierarchy of decision-making is number one, clinical signs. How does the patient feel? If a patient has bone metastases and their pain is getting worse, that's a bad sign, regardless of what the PSA says and regardless of what scans say. So number one on our hierarchy is symptoms. What is the patient telling you? Number two on our hierarchy is scans. Okay, and that, that's the question that's being asked here is how often do you repeat scans? And then number three on the hierarchy is PSA. Now, the question about how often do we repeat scans, you know, it's a question of what are we trying to accomplish? And obviously what we're trying to do is make sure that if the cancer is getting worse, we catch it. And if it's responding, we know it so that we know if the treatment we're using is, is working or not. And like I say, traditionally doctors have relied on PSA and thought it's uh, quite effective. I recently published a study from one of the big metastatic trials uh, called ECOG 3805. We just published it in European Urology Oncology um, back in, uh, I guess it would have been August. And it looked at this question of how often does PSA really tell you what's going on and how often, if you get a scan, do you find the disease is getting worse despite what the PSA said? And we find, you know, somewhere around 30% of the time the disease is getting worse on the scan, even though the PSA is not getting worse. And what that means is tumors are growing and you know, if we want to jump in early, we would be delayed if we relied on the PSA. And so it opens up the debate then of to say, should we be getting scans? Obviously, I think yes. I think scans should be part of how we normally follow patients, but not all doctors agree with that. Some like to rely on the, on the PSA. And the, and the counter argument is, look, scans take time. Scans cost money. Um, obviously, the medical economy is incredibly strained right now. Right, the the country can't you know handle ever rising costs forever. And is there a perfect balance point of how often we should scan? How much is enough? So the answer to the question is we don't know. 
It's a debatable point. It's not something that we can put to the test in a randomized clinical trial, you know, a trial of, uh, you know, six month scans versus no scans or whatnot. In my practice, I scan a metastatic patient in first line every six months or if symptoms get worse or if the PSA or other blood work starts to get worse. In advanced patients, so second, third line therapy, you start to get on chemo, whatnot. Then I start scanning every three to four months. And the difference there is the pace of the disease. So earlier on, the disease moves slower. Later on, it moves quicker. And that's really what needs to drive how often we scan. So in the advanced disease patients, you know, then I start treating and scanning you know, much the way we do with any other cancer. right? If you had lung cancer or breast cancer or colon cancer, Right? You scan every three months in metastatic disease. That's routine. And in prostate cancer, the answer should be the same because in late disease, you know, the progress of the disease is much the same as these other cancers. Okay? And PSA becomes less reliable the more the patient gets treated. The very worst prostate cancers, the PSA often goes to zero right? in, in anaplastic or neuroendocrine prostate cancer. It makes no PSA. And if you just relied on that number, you might think things are going well, when in fact, things are going very poorly and you get a scan and suddenly there's a lot of disease. So my answer is first line therapy scan every six months, later line therapy scan every three to four months. Very good. We got one more question, uh, Dr. Bryce, and this one's uh, from uh, another one from Ms. Clifton, Kathy Clifton. If the CT shows several nodules, one being seven millimeters with a PET, Tell us if it is cancer. Uh, we are told a biopsy can't be done because they are too small. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, it's a good question. Uh, um, you know, one of the things that happens with scanning, right, is, is, you know, if we take healthy, normal people off the street and we do scans, we usually find something that's not, you know, 100% textbook normal, okay? Now here in Arizona, and, and you know, I, I don't know where this person is based, but here in Arizona, you know, valley fever is a common problem. And if a person gets valley fever at any point in their life, they're likely to have nodules in the lungs for the rest of their life. They're little, little bits of scar tissue, okay? So most pulmonary nodules are scar, not cancer. But how do you know the difference? And how do you figure that out? Well, ultimately, you know, as, as the question suggests, a biopsy is the ultimate answer, right? Like I said earlier, you're in California. Okay, so, so again, you know, there, there's a, Pneumonia can cause pulmonary nodules, tuberculosis, valley fever, histoplasmosis. There's a lot of reasons for people to have pulmonary nodules, okay, that have nothing to do with cancer. But again, how do you figure out what's cancer and what's scar tissue or, or infection? And the answer is what we were saying earlier and what the question suggests is, you know, you have to do a biopsy to know for sure, right? There, there is no imaging test that's 100% definitive for cancer. The only definitive test is a biopsy. So there's levels of suspicion and levels of confidence. Now there's the question of a PET scan. So a PET scan is a metabolism scan. Okay, it's a CT scan where the patient is injected with some kind of radio tracer that that's attached to a metabolic molecule. And in a traditional PET, it's FDG. And FDG is one of the components of the sugar metabolism pathway. So what that means is that cells that are burning a lot of sugar will light up hot in a PET scan. And high metabolism can be normal activity, so the brain and the heart are always hot. It can be inflammation or infection, right? So if you have a, you know, a rip-roaring cellulitis from cutting your leg, that's going to be hot. Or it could be a rapidly growing tumor. Okay, so a melanoma or a lymphoma is going to be hot on a scan. In general, prostate cancer is cold because it's a slow growing tumor. Okay, so in, in prostate cancer, we now have specialized PET scans, not FDG, but things like PSMA or choline or F18 Axiomen scans. And these are different metabolites that are selectively uptaken by prostate cancer cells and metabolized a bit more rapidly. So prostate cancer lights up a bit more. The issue, okay, the problem is with a seven millimeter nodule, not only is it 
hard to hit with a biopsy, but it's so small that it can often appear cold. When I talk about hot versus cold and metabolism, you know, the size of the lesion matters. So the ability of a PET scan to discriminate goes down as you go down in size. Okay. So where I find a PET scan useful in this scenario you're describing is, you know, if you have, say, multiple pulmonary nodules or lymph nodes or something that are suspicious, we do a PET scan and we see that one stands out or a couple stand out as being hotter than the others, then those are the ones we go and biopsy, right? It helps direct me to which spot I want to biopsy, but ultimately I still need the biopsy to know what's going on. Okay, so that's not very satisfying for your question, right? The, the second way to decide whether a, can, whether a spot on a scan is cancer or not is serial imaging, right? So scar tissue, right, is stable, right? If, if you had valley fever when you were 15 and now you're 60 and we see a nodule, well, the first thing we do with a seven millimeter nodule is we're gonna repeat a scan in three months. And if it's cancer, it should be growing if, unless you're treating it. But if it's, you know, scar tissue, it should stay the same. And so I have countless patients in my practice where now we have scans that are, you know, five years old and we can show them year after year after year, that spot didn't change. And that's when you know that's not cancer, it was scar tissue. And then you're thankful that you didn't go in and have the lung surgeon try to cut them out, right? Because it was just scar tissue, right? So that's two parts to your, to your question is, you know, unfortunately right now a pet probably wouldn't be discriminatory at that size. So then you're talking about biopsy versus serial imaging. Thank you, Dr. Bryce. Um, we've got a question that's in the chat this time um, from Mr. Loda. Um, and I don't know if you can see it there. Uh, prior to SBRT proton treatment, a PSA of 11 plus with a Gleason of four plus three, uh, PSA after Eligard was 2.1. Should I be tested for inherited genetics? Yeah, so th this is an intermediate risk cancer. So by guideline criteria, uh, we would have the discussion. We don't have to test. So we would say high risk, very high risk or metastatic, then absolutely we recommend testing. For intermediate risk, we recommend a conversation. It is very reasonable to do genetic testing. R remember, and so in your case, we probably don't need to treat based upon the genetic signature. You don't need to go on a PARP inhibitor. Hopefully you've been cured, but there's still the conversation for the family, right? And as I say, with intermediate risk, it's probably not 15%. Maybe it's five to 10% chance that you're a carrier, but it's a simple test. You know, it's either um, a, a cheek swab or, or, you know, spit in a tube or a single blood test. It takes, you know, 10 to 14 days to get a result. And then, you know, you know, if there is a cancer gene, uh, if you're carrying a cancer gene or not. Uh, and then what we would do at Mayo Clinic is I, I would then send you to a genetic counselor to talk you through all the details of here's what the gene means. Here's the cancers that are associated with that gene. Here's what you can do in terms of um, risk reduction and early detection. And here's how you might have the conversation with family members uh, who, you know, you might want to tell this information to, because, you know, some people, they don't want the family there. They just want the conversation one-on-one -on -one at first. Other people, they're going to bring the whole family. We can do it any which way. Uh, but yes, in general, I would, I would test somebody. I test more than normal because like I say, I'd rather find your cancer early, prevent it and, and cure it rather than let it get too far advanced. Thank you, Dr. Bryce. Checking to see if we've got any more open questions. A question came in about Lupron three month shot. So um, Lupron is an LHRH agent. Ba basically this is an analog of a natural hormone, GNRH, right? Gonadotropin releasing hormone. And so there are multiple GNRH products on the market. Lupron happens to be one of them. Uh, but Lupron, that particular brand has um, gone on shortage nationally. So here at Mayo in Arizona, we simply switched to one of the other brands. Ultimately, I mean, truly it's the same medicine. It's a 
It's a gonadotropin releasing hormone analog. The difference between the brands actually just tends to be the formulation, um, you know, what it dissolved in. And so it's, you know, injected into different parts of the body. Um, but really there is not a significant or meaningful difference in efficacy. These are really the same medicine. Uh, so I have no concerns about switching a patient from one uh, gonadotropin analog to another. Um, and, and we, you know, if there's national shortages, we just have to respond and, and you know, do what's necessary. Is there a difference in how cancer hospitals treat cancer? Um, so, um, yes, I mean, inevitably, right? I mean, it, you know, it's, it's you know, we can't possibly say that everyone does the same thing. Now, you know, in 2020, you know, hopefully we're mostly practicing evidence-based medicine. And so there should be substantial agreement, right? I mean, we should all be in the same ballpark. But of course there's nuances and there's, there's shades of gray. There's lots of shades of gray in medicine. There's only so much that's definite. And so you will get different answers at different places in terms of you know, what should be done. There's also the fact that cancer uh, treatment, oncology is a rapidly moving field. I mean, one of the reasons I went into this field, uh, one of the reasons I continue to um, you know, be appreciative of doing this work, of doing this research, is this is a field that reinvents itself every few years. The pace of change is, is fantastic, okay? And so, you know, one of the things you will have in cancer care is you'll have, you know, different doctors are kind of at different points on that spectrum. You know, much like technology, whether you're talking about, you know, iPhones or, um, uh, you know, whatever technology, you know, automobiles, you know, there are early adopters, there are late adopters, and there's a whole bell curve in between. So you'll see differences based on that, right? Um, you'll also see differences based upon expertise. Uh, you know, what is someone's particular training? What are they good at? But honestly, you're also gonna see differences of opinions between doctors, right? Um, and then I guess the other thing about, you know, different cancer centers is, you know, a lot of medicine is science, but a lot of medicine is art. It's also our values. You know, the humanistic side of medicine is tremendously important. So of course there are gonna be differences, cultural differences at different centers. I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is Manhattan is not the same as Arizona, is not the same as California, is not the same as Minnesota. Um, so there are cultural differences. And without question, I mean, as physicians, we try to be sensitive to the cultural differences the patient brings. Uh, but of course we're human beings too. Right. So the way I do things, I'm, I'm sure is different than, you know, a doctor in uh, China or Brazil or uh, or, you know, uh, Russia or England or whatnot. Right. So. Um, so, yes, there's going to be differences. Um, and, you know, in the modern era, we're all very accustomed to patients getting second opinions. Really, modern doctors mostly don't mind at all. I'm very comfortable with my patients going out for second opinions. As you might expect by this time, I, I really know, you know, 95 plus percent of the time, they're gonna hear the same information from their next doctor that they heard from me, but at least now they have more confidence, right? And, you know, helping you as a patient through the psychological journey of cancer is an important part of what we do. Ah, okay. So next question here, Gleason 10 and 63 year old. Radiation or surgery? Right, tough, tough. Yeah. So high risk prostate cancer, we tend to say that radiation has the better data. The urologists will argue with that some because they'll also say, well, you know, if you're at a highly specialized center with better surgeons, the outcomes are better than what we saw in clinical trials. And there is validity to that. I don't disagree with that. Here at Mayo Clinic, you will get a multi-specialty consultation. Our patients will meet with both the radiation doctor and the surgeon to hear about the rest and risks and benefits of both approaches. You know, undergo a full workup. You know, uh, you know, we're talking about a, a high risk with a Gleason 10, so get the genetic testing as well. 
Uh, and then, you know, make a decision based upon, you know, what you consider to be acceptable risks uh, with the two different approaches, because the side effect profiles are different. And so, you know, the surgeons and the, the radiation oncologists will argue some over this, but ultimately it is the patient's decision. And that's why we offer multi-specialty discussion with the patient. And every now and then I'll, ask, I'll be asked to get involved as the medical oncologist to kind of provide the third party opinion so, since I don't, you know, have a, um, I don't have any vested interest in the outcome between surgery and radiation. So the answer is either is an option. Uh, you really uh, need to talk to the both sets of physicians and, and kind of weigh your options. Thank you, Dr. Bryce. Are there any other questions? We've got about 20 minutes left, so I'm happy to take more. Hey, you're welcome, Ms. Clifton. Uh, um, so this, this is our first time, as I say, kind of doing this format uh, you know, COVID forced it upon us. Um, but, you know, the upside to this form, and I think we see it here, is that, you know, people outside of Arizona can can participate, you know, when we do things online. Um, so we're still trying to learn, though, how to do this well, uh, how to do it best. So if you wouldn't mind, you know, filling out our post uh, uh, session questionnaire that, that Ms. Jones has posted there. Uh, we do look at the feedback. I look at every piece of feedback from everyone who's done this. Uh, Ms. Jones and I have, have co-led this uh, program for several years. So, I mean, it's a lot of feedback and we're always trying to put together a better uh, seminar. Um, and it may well be in the future that we'll go back to some in-person component and do a hybrid meeting with both online and in-person. And, um, and we'll see, we'll see. So please do give us your feedback. Um, and if there's nothing else, I mean, we can wrap up 15 minutes early. That's okay. So, um, um, Stacy, any any further comments or? Nope. I was just going to ask again. Um, same thing you just said about completion of the the survey. We certainly welcome and need that feedback to help us to plan for future um, uh, events. So we we would welcome all of the feedback that you have to share. I want to make sure there are no other questions before we end our session. Okay. I think we're good, Dr. Bryce. Thank you, everyone. I think we're good. Have a great team. Thank you.